Welcome back to the Burrow Shire podcast. I'm Brandon Vaught, one of the co-hosts, and as always, I'm joined by my best friend, the other co-host, Father Blake Britton. Father Blake, good to see you, buddy. Likewise, always wonderful to be with you, brother. Now, over the last several episodes after they've aired, we've received a lot of comments and emails from people with all sorts of other suggested topics, and we love those, so please keep sending them in. We're building up our episode list right now based mostly around what you guys want to talk with us about. We never wanted this to be just sort of a one-way didactic lecture series. We wanted this to be uh, a conversational feel. So we love hearing from you, responding to you in the comments, uh, but please keep the topic suggestions coming. You can either leave it as a comment underneath the episode or at the com website. We have our email address there where you can send it in. Today, we're going to be talking about spiritual woundedness. Now, this might not be something that comes to mind immediately for people. I know I didn't even hear about this concept till like 10 years after I was already Catholic, and then it came up in a spiritual directing uh, session with a really good spiritual director I was working with at the time. Uh, But I guess, Father, let's, let's start off by defining our terms. Always love to do that. So what is spiritual woundedness? What should we know about it? Yeah, so nowadays, unfortunately, there's a real lacuna, meaning there's like a real lack uh, of awareness of of the different movements and things that are going on in our hearts. And one of the most important things that we have to be aware of, especially as human beings and as Christian persons, is what are those areas of our souls that have been affected by sin? So we know that St. John Paul II teaches us about what we call systematic evil or the systematic structure of sin. This, of course, is based on hundreds of years of theology. The fact that sin is never just personal, but sin actually morphs into a web of connectivity that can affect us on multiple levels, especially sin which is mortal. So for those of us who throughout our lives experience either some form of negativity, whether that be verbal, physical, whether that be spiritual, uh, the mocking of our identity, experiences that we had in childhood, adolescence, young adulthood, and adulthood. These things leave a mark on our souls, and they ultimately, and we'll get to this later in the podcast, they ultimately lead to certain mentalities, attitudes, and activities that are not healthy because they're reactions to wounds that have gone unnamed and unhealed. So there's a very important emphasis that we need to start taking, especially as spiritual directors and as confessors, noting and leading souls to a deeper awareness of those wounds and those places where they've been negatively affected by their own personal sin or the sins of others in their lives. You know, I've noticed over the years that as religion has receded in the public consciousness, other things come to fill that vacuum. You know, nature abhors a vacuum. So as, say, religious community declines, people go out and find communitarian identities in sports, in ideological groups, you know, in in whatever you find. And then the same thing goes with the sacraments, that as the sacraments start to fade in terms of practice, people turn to other things that fill those real needs. The needs still remain. They look for it elsewhere. And I think this is an area that we've seen where Um, psychology has kind of filled in the gap of what we might have described as like spiritual direction. Um, And a lot of the problems that we have interiorly, not concerning our physical makeup, but interiorly are reduced to problems of the psyche or the mind rather than soul problems. But what you're talking about here is digging deep beyond the body, beyond bodily wounds, beyond problems with the psyche or the mind, but to to problems with the soul, places where we've been wounded at the deepest part of our spiritual beings. Right. One of my professors in seminary had a wonderful maxim. He said that the confessional has been replaced by the psychologist couch. And it's so true. There are many people nowadays that actually are not in need of counseling. So counseling is a wonderful thing, and I'm not bashing in any way, shape, or form. There is a positive, most certainly, aspect to receiving counseling of some form or even some form of psychiatric care for those who may have more serious struggles. But there's also something to be said about the fact that many people who are experiencing anxiety, who are experiencing fear or quote-unquote depression, it's not actually a clinical form but it's because there are deep wounds within their soul that have not yet been addressed adequately 
specifically through the spiritual tools that we've been given through the sacramental life of the church. And these are now leading to more superficial and psychological manifestations. So for example, if a person is having anxiety on a regular basis, it most likely is not because it's a clinical case of anxiety or some form of anxiety that has necessarily a, a, a mental capacity, but rather there's something that's unsettled in the depths of their heart that has yet to be reconciled with themselves and with Christ and has yet to receive the sacramental grace of confession or the sacramental grace of the Eucharist or of the blessing of an ordained minister of the church. And because of that, it's been unaddressed the way that it should be. And that's why it continues to be a problem even into adulthood. So this is a topic that I address on a regular basis, especially in, in the sacrament of reconciliation and in pastoral counseling. Let's take a quick tour through Catholic history and look at some of the masters of this realm, masters of the soul, masters of the spiritual life, spiritual woundedness, because uh, before we get to the details of, say, how to diagnose spiritual woundedness, how to be healed from it, I think it's important to recognize that the Catholic Church has been dealing with this for like 2,000 years. Right. Like, you know, the, the modern uh, psychologies and psychiatries have come on the scene relatively recently in the last couple hundred years. But like, this is nothing new to the church. I'm thinking particularly of church fathers, someone like, say, Augustine. I mean, read the confessions, and it's like, here's, here's a guy that went de deep down into the darkest unexplored corners of his soul. Like you can almost sense the adventure of him like discovering who he is, his deepest longings, his deepest flaws, like exposing them to the light. Uh, it's, it's like an adventure of discovery. And a lot of people, and me included, most of our spiritual life isn't like that. Like we're kind of just stay in the shallows, stay on the surface level. When we talk about sinful inclinations or when we go to confession, confessing sins, we're just confessing, you know, I did this, I didn't do that. You know, sins of commission, sins of omission, I did it this many times or I didn't, you know, we rarely take the level of exploration that some of these figures took. So let's walk through some of them. I know one of your favorites is Evagoras Ponticus from the yes. fourth century. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about him. Well, that reminds me of a quote from Chesterton, and he says that once all the psychologists and scientists run up the mountain of truth, they'll spend all of these years running around the mountain of truth. Eventually, they'll arrive at the top and find a bunch of theologians smoking cigars at the top. <laughs> <laughs> With Chesterton smoking his We've cigar. We've been there for a while, you know. <laughs> but that being said, most certainly, there are characters throughout history who have already delved into the depths of these notions, which pop psychology is only now really coming to a proper understanding of with different kinds of vocabulary. But Evagoras Ponticus, a fourth century monk, is one of the first. He wrote a phenomenal text entitled The Practicos, which is The Practices, and I strongly encourage our viewers and listeners to buy a copy of The Practicos. It's very readable. It's done in the typical patristic desert father style, which is not so much a written out book in our understanding, of an academic text, but rather is in small chunks of paragraphs that reflect on different aspects of the spiritual life. One of those aspects which Evagoras Ponticus focuses on is the eight evil thoughts. Specifically within those eight evil thoughts, he mentions the eight base desires of the human soul and the eight ways in which those manifest themselves in woundedness. And he also speaks to the fact that there's a specific demon who specializes in manipulating our woundedness so as to allow it to direct our lives as opposed to reason and holiness directing our lives, healing directing our lives. And that demon's name is the demon of Ascetia. This demon, which is one of the most dangerous demons in existence according to Evagoras as well as Thomas Aquinas, is the demon that specifically hates your personal holiness. This is the demon of mediocrity. This is the demon that does not desire you to become a saint. And so he'll do everything that he can to keep us at the bare minimum of our faith. As I say, the demon of Ascetia doesn't mind practicing Catholics, he just doesn't want holy ones. And there's a difference between those two things. So he is the one that comes and says, you know, God loves you so much no matter what. I mean, you don't have to go to mass today. I mean, I mean you don't have to go to daily mass. I mean, you go to mass every Sunday. You, know, you don't have to read the Bible. You're already going to mass and hearing scripture. You, know? you don't have to read the catechism. You know the basics of the faith, come on. I mean, God loves you, right? And he sort of tries to keep you in this place. He uses truths just to maintain us in comfortability. But also this demon, and we'll get to this later on when we talk about the specifics of woundedness, this demon also 
specializes in weaponizing failures or hurts of our past against successes and graces of our future. So he will take places where we've had failures, he'll take places where we've been hurt, he'll take places where others have hurt us, and he'll weaponize them so that they cripple us and make us feel unable or unworthy to acquire sainthood and holiness. So I did this crazy thing when I was in college that I'm still ashamed of, now as a 45-year-old man or woman, and that demon convinces me that I am unable now to achieve holiness because of the, what I did when I was back in college. And that keeps me now looking for satisfaction in other unhealthy places or keeps me stagnant in my journey of holiness. So this is most certainly a serious issue that we have to address. And Evagoras Ponticus was one of the first to recognize that. Of course, Augustine, who you've already mentioned, one of the great explorers of existentiality, one of the great explorers of the inner person, mainly through himself. He invented, for heaven's sake, the genre of autobiography, which is still a literary genre until this day. Then you have Ignatius of Loyola. He's probably the most popular currently because of his famous rules of discernment. These are the ways in which he helps us, as he says, finds the tell of the demon and all of our thoughts, feelings, and desires. So he's given us a wonderful resources. And most recently, I would add to that list St. John Paul II. There are a few saints in history who specialized so abundantly in anthropology, who had such an incredible understanding of the human person and how our thoughts, feelings, and desires need to be redeemed and fulfilled in the thoughts, feelings, and desires of Christ. So institutions such as the John Paul II Healing Institute, founded by Dr. Bob Schutz, and various other places have specialized in really focusing on these teachings of John Paul II's uh, theology of the body and different uh, anthropology so as to help us heal those wounds and also reach the fullness of our vocation to sainthood. I think from my experience wrestling with this concept of spiritual woundedness personally in the confessional elsewhere, one of the difficulties is that the wounds are not immediately evident. So first of all, you have to dig deep into your soul and into your history. You have to do some hard work, some hard soul searching to get at the root that is underneath some of your more prevalent sins. But also, even when you get all the way down into your soul, it's not as if it's just neutral territory. Um, the devil's there, God is there, and there's competing, um, there, there's competing space in there to uh, interpret your wounds. A lot of the language that the spiritual masters will use is between reality and fantasy. So even when you recognize a wound, new questions emerge like, well, is that is that really a fair presentation of the wound? Is Am I fantasizing around that wound? Um, this is all kind of abstract. Maybe help concretize it for us a little of bit. Of course. Yeah, understanding that distinction, I'm so happy that you brought that up, Brandon. Between reality and fantasy is key in spiritual woundedness. What does Satan hate more than anything, according to the ancient fathers? Reality. Why? Because that's where God lives. God is real. God is in the immediacy of our lives. God is not some abstract, distant figure, but he exists right before us. This is what Luigi Giussani and Hans von Balthasar will call reality is given. The fact that where we find our vocation to holiness is not out there. It's not in this place to where like, the grass is greener on the other side. I always share this when I have uh, husbands and wives come to me for either confession or for some form of spiritual counseling. They say, well, I could become a saint if only I didn't have to take care of my kids all the time. I could become a saint if only I didn't have that job or if only I had more time to pray. And I always have to remind them, no, your sainthood lies within caring for your children. Your sainthood lies within being where you are and seeing Christ where you are. Satan doesn't want that to happen. So what he's constantly trying to do is create fantasy around us. And what I mean by that is Satan does not want us to encounter Christ within our lives, so he'll constantly try to bring us out of the reality of our lives and either seduce us into thinking that there's something better out there than our own reality, and he'll keep us chasing after that fantasy, which of course leaves us bitter and jaded and now unable to acquire authentic holiness, or he'll try to find some other way to use woundedness in order to make us believe something about ourselves that's not true. So you're absolutely right, Brandon, in noting that there are two narratives going on, and actually three narratives. You have your own, you have the enemies, and you have the truth, which is coming from Jesus Christ and from the grace of the Holy Spirit. The enemy's narrative would be when I was 10 years old 
and I'll share one of my own personal stories. But you know, when I was young, I had a crush on this girl, right? And I really wanted her to be my girlfriend, right? What kind of young boy could actually have a girlfriend? But, and there was another boy who also had a crush on her. And so she made us race right around the playground to win her hand. <laughs> I'll never forget this. And I ended up losing the race, right? And she was not my girlfriend. She ended up becoming a girlfriend to this other guy whose name shall remain nameless <laughs> for his own safety and sake. But all joking aside, that left something, though, in my boyish heart of inadequacy, of not feeling that I was able to, to do something good enough. And that carried on with me for quite some time, even into my young adulthood, until thankfully through spiritual direction and through confession, I was able to recognize that I had this lingering thought and fear of failure this lingering thought and fear of being inadequate and of not being able to sufficiently live out my vocation to the priesthood the way that God has called me to. And I had to address that and go all the way back to a seemingly insignificant part of my life, which was losing this race for this girl. And really it, it led to and it nourished a lot of other lies that the enemy had convinced me of. Namely, I'm not good enough. You know, I can't do these sort of things. Don't fail. It's bad whenever you fail. But those, of course, were all fantasies. Those are lies because with Christ, he can redeem failure. With Christ, he can redeem those parts of my souls that are inadequate. With Christ, he can really arise within my heart and make me a saint even amidst my own brokenness. But that's the truth the enemy does not want us to see. So that distinction between reality and fantasy is absolutely key in coming to a point of spiritual healing. And I strongly encourage our viewers and listeners to start thinking about that. What's real and what's fake? And we're going to give you some tools to identify that towards the end the end of the podcast. I remember reading a book by John Eldridge when I was a Protestant. Eldridge is kind of a Protestant spiritual master. And he said it was a book on masculinity. And he said the, the deepest question at the heart of every man is, do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes? It's the question every boy is asking his father to answer for him. As he gets older, it's the question he's asking of his wife, of his boss at work, and then ultimately of God. Like, am I enough? Do I have what it takes? It's your question of, am I adequate? And again, as you said, to reiterate, you need to dig down deep to answer that question, but it's not like there's just one clear, easy answer that you find and you're done. You have these competing narratives. There's one voice telling you, no, you don't have what it takes. Like you, you are incompetent and inadequate and look at all these times you failed and come up short. And then you have another voice, you know, that's maybe your own voice that's kind of waffling back and forth. And then you have the narrative of Jesus Christ saying, yes, 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 you have what it takes. And God the Father saying, yes, you're my beloved son. You have what it takes. Um, so, like, it seems to me this, this art of navigating spiritual woundedness is really the art of navigating these different voices that are answering questions we all have. And we've got to find and listen to the right voice. Yes. And that's where having a state of constant prayer is key. This comes straight from St. Ignatius of Loyola. He calls this recollection. But developing within ourselves through daily prayer, specifically by just spending 10 to 15 minutes a day. I mean, that is so key. If, I could t if every single Christian were to spend 15 minutes a day in silent contemplation before bed or in the morning and just allow Christ to speak to their hearts, it would change the church in a very radical way. Because we'd start becoming more aware of the thoughts, feelings, and desires which are moving within our hearts. And we'd be able to name what's reality and what's fantasy and allow that to guide our actions as opposed to just reacting inappropriately to different situations which are passing in our lives. So it most certainly is that navigation of those different narrations which are taking place. Again, there are two narratives and then there's the truth. So you have the enemy's narrative, you have our narrative, and then you have the truth which is with Christ. And the, he's always inviting our narrative to join his truth so that we too might come to live in the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Whoever hear the truth, hear my voice. One of the most powerful transactions in sacred scripture between Pontius Pilate and Christ. When he says, what is truth? Whoever hears the truth, hears my voice. Those are the citizens of my kingdom. Well, the kingdom of Christ is our soul. This is where he's established his throne, is in the human heart. And that's what the incarnation and the resurrection is all about. So will we allow ourselves to be guided by the voice of truth, who's Christ? Or will we allow our own narrative to be conformed to the perverted and twisted narrative of the enemy who's trying to degradate our dignity as beloved children of God?
All right, let's talk a little bit through how this plays out in some real life scenarios. Um, you and I have both worked through this stuff in our own lives, and maybe we can give a few personal examples from ourselves. But um, I thought we'd maybe do some hypothetical examples of, you know, here's a situation with the person, what they're wrestling with. Here's how you would navigate it directionally from a spiritual perspective. But before we get there, um, let's talk about some some general principles that will drive these hypothetical scenarios. You mentioned the name of Dr. Bob Schutz before. He's the founder of this JP2 Healing Center. Say a little bit more about him, about the principles that undergird his work. And then also tell us a little bit about, um, I was fascinated learning when you went through seminary, you had some really good professors and guides in this art of spiritual direction, spiritual woundedness. So lay it all out. Give us, give us some good stuff. Sure. So there are two people who I'm going to have to immediately recognize and, and contribute what I'm about to share. Uh, and that is Dr. Bob Schutz, who's an amazing man. I, I personally never had the privilege of meeting him, but I'm, I've been very deeply influenced by a lot of his protégés as well as a lot of the material that he's published. And then one person I have had the privilege of meeting and who actually served as my, as my own spiritual director, and that is Father John Horn. He's one of the founders of the Institute for Priestly Formation, and he's also the publisher of a fantastic book, which I have uh, sent the link to Brandon, and he'll make sure to put it into the blog notes, excuse me, into the podcast notes. But the name of the book is Heart Speaks to Heart, and Father John Horn goes through different ways that we can start this journey of understanding, this art of understanding these different narratives and how we're supposed to navigate spiritual woundedness. So I thank Dr. Bob Schutz for his amazing work and also Father John Horn for the great spiritual direction that he's provided for so many people. And so that, and that this, book, just to jump in, like that, that is more of like a workbook, which is, I think, a benefit of it. It's not just a book that you just read and absorb. Like that book itself guides you through this process of examining your soul at the deepest levels and searching for these wounds and then figuring out how to, how to find healing in them through Christ. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a whole section in here called the journal worksheet, which is the, the inner heart of my faith. And it goes through your life in three year segments. And for those who may be a little bit older, it even has some blank spaces for you to add <laughs> three year segments, because I think that it actually ends at the age of 45. So uh, but so for those who might be more aged, uh, there's blank spaces for you to add those three-year segments in, or maybe you can put them into decade segments <laughs> if necessary. But all joking aside, uh, it's a wonderful workbook, and it does. It takes you through a life review of what's happened throughout the different parts of your heart and the different areas of wound, but also the different areas of thanksgiving so that we can see where the hand of Jesus has been with us throughout the entirety of our lives. So using Dr. Bob Schutz and Father John Horn's illustrations, let's go ahead and go through this notion of spiritual woundedness and the healing of the heart. So in all of our lives, we experience something called wounds. These are hurts. These are abuses. These are verbal accusations. These are experiences in our childhood, uh, adolescence, and adulthood, which have left us deeply scarred, which deeply offended us. Around those wounds, Satan immediately comes and he starts depositing lies because Satan hates us and his goal is to try to twist and to degrade our dignity. So he comes to this wound like a shark drawn to blood in the water and he immediately starts trying to build a narrative around that wound, trying to insulate it with his lies. Once that is properly insulated, if we hear those lies enough, then we start believing in them. And we develop what Dr. Bob Schutz and Father John Horn call inner vows, which basically are attitudes or ways of interpreting reality, not based in reality, but based on our wound and on the lies that the enemy has told us. To give some practical examples that I've heard and worked through with different people. So there's this one young woman who I was working with, and she had a boyfriend who actually ended up becoming her fiance. But one day they're at dinner, and he says something about her dress, you know, so just off off handedly. Now, to all of our young men listening, he, never do mistake. that. <laughs> no, huge mistake. I mean, that's the deep wound right there is he needs to right. be <laughs> healed from that mistake. Another wound. <laughs> <laughs> so never do that. But going back to this scenario, he mentioned that about her dress and she immediately became very angry, but almost in this uh, in this unnecessary way, insofar as what she thought was what she said in response was. So are you calling me fat? Are you calling me ugly? And he never said any of those things. He just made 
an offhand comment about her dress, but she heard something entirely different. So what you see here was this overreaction to reality that wasn't appropriate to what was actually taking place. Well, that's because as we walked through this with her through spiritual direction and through pastoral counseling, that was rooted in something much deeper. The fact that when she was younger in grade school, she struggled with weight and she struggled with how she looked. And a lot of the other girls used to make fun of her because of that. And that was something that was unaddressed and never was received the proper attention or adequate spiritual healing. So now as an adult woman, anytime that someone would make a comment about her appearance, she would immediately interpret that as I'm fat and ugly, even if the person is not actually saying that. So you see there how the enemy, based in, once again, a seemingly insignificant wound of being made fun of for this that happened years and years and years ago, you would think, well, I'm past that, I'm an adult now. Not necessarily, not necessarily if it wasn't addressed appropriately. And so you could see how that wound of her being bullied as a little girl then created a web of lies about her appearance. And from that web of lies, she developed a certain attitude and belief about herself and also a way of interpreting others that was not respectful to what was actually taking place and wasn't appropriate to reality. So what I had to do with her was slowly walk her back to those different areas where she had been mocked or bullied or made fun of in her life and have her renounce those lies in the name of Jesus and to reaffirm truth, the truth that she has always been beautiful in the eyes of the Father, the truth that she is a beloved daughter of God, the truth that people do not give her her dignity, the Father gives her her dignity. And this allowed her eventually to have the freedom so that when people would make comments about her hair or would say something about her dress, that she no longer overreacted to the situation, but rather acted out of a sense of worth, knowing I'm beautiful and I know who I am as a beloved daughter of God. And this also helped her relationship with her fiance. Another example with men is I work a lot, especially with young men who are struggling with pornography, which is really a, a true epidemic of our time. And it's important for us to recognize that when it comes to pornography addiction, that is never something that is just rooted simply in lust. Young men and grown men do not look at pornography just because they want some form of satisfaction on the physical level. There's always something deeper that is feeding that. There's always a deeper wound that is making them turn towards this form of satisfaction that is inadequate and inappropriate and sinful. So what I've had to do also with a lot of these young men and grown men is to help them walk back and see when did you really first start looking at pornography and why was that? So in one case, he started looking at pornography right after he had a really bad breakup in high school. So you see how this really bad breakup with this woman, that young woman that he was dating, left him with a feeling of not being man enough and also left him with a lack of confidence in his masculinity. And he never wanted to risk getting hurt that way again. So he turned towards this artificial form of satiating just merely his sexual desire as opposed to actually looking for authentic relationship with a true woman. So that was something else I had to walk with him through and slowly go through the wound of the breakup, identify that as the problem. So the problem is not actually the pornography itself, but rather the problem is that you believe in the lie of the inadequacy of your masculinity. We have to renounce and break that lie through, the, through spiritual direction and the sacrament of reconciliation and rebuild the truth that you're a son of the Father and that you're called to holiness either as a husband or as a priest. And this now allowed that young man to break his addiction to pornography, thankfully, and he lives as a Christian man who is still discerning marriage. So these are just some different ways that I personally had pastoral experiences helping people identify wounds or lies and inner vows or inner attitudes and seeing how that has helped them break certain habits or ways of living, which they had had for decades. One thing that's helped me has been going through that book you mentioned by Father John Horn, The Heart Speaks to Heart. And again, it's more of a workbook. It's not something you just read and absorb and move on. It causes you to do this deep soul-searching reflection. And it's exposed for me incidents like those you've mentioned in the past where it's like, oh, yeah, I have totally forgotten about that. It's just sitting mm -hmm. in my subconscious, but it's it's driving a lot of my, say, sinful reactions or sinful behaviors today that, you know, it's, it's just lurking and hiding in the shadows of my history. And this book helped to bring it to the fore. But an, another thing that I uh, recognize, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is some people might be listening to this thinking, 
I'm not sure if I have like specific pinpointed moments in my past. And this was true for me when I was working through some of this with a spiritual director. It's like, like um, in your situation where you, you could remember being on the playground, that specific moment with that specific girl and that specific outcome. It's like, can you, can you remember anything in your past that might have triggered this reaction? And despite a lot of prayer and soul searching, it's kind of just like, no, I can't. But then the second move is to recognize, well, but there was this and that and this and sort of cumulatively they're they're playing together and converging toward a wound it might not have been like one giant slash like you on the playground that cut your heart right. deeply but it's like all these little pinpricks that have wounded your heart in different ways that have produced this cumulative effect do you see that with people that you work with absolutely especially if they're exposed to other people who are struggling with certain mortal sins or they're exposed to a series of different attitudes which are sinful or inappropriate. So for example, let's just say uh, that you grew up in a house where maybe there was a lot of sarcasm and pessimism. So even though you had a very loving father and a very loving mother and necess not necessarily anything horrible ever happened to you in one specific moment, years and years of receiving that kind of negativity, years and years of hearing pessimism, years and years of hearing sarcasm, years and years of hearing jokes all the time without any sort of serious, deep, substantial conversation or contemplation, years and years of being belittled or being joked about and not being able to take things seriously, that leaves an effect in us that once again is an unhealthy way of approaching the truth, an unhealthy way of seeing reality, of seeing Christ. So that's also something that we would have to experience a point of conversion in our lives. Once again, there may not be something very explicitly hurtful that happened to us, whether that be uh, an abuse as a child or uh, you know, a breakup with someone that we really had a deep relationship with or maybe seeing a movie or some sort of video that really traumatized us. It may just be a series of small events or negative attitudes that we've experienced. Another thing that I always help people be mindful of, and we could just have another podcast just on this topic of sort of demonology and angelology and sort of the, the interplay between demons and angels, but note that if we are in a, an environment in which someone else is struggling with a particular mortal sin, that is not isolated. That evil affects that environment if it's not cleansed, if it's not claimed, if it's not redeemed in Christ. And I'm thinking here also very specifically about those who may have struggled in the past with the occult or ever used a Ouija board or gone to a palm reader or tarot cards or any of those sort of witchcraft uh, things. That leaves an effect, you know, and I strongly encourage our, our viewers and listeners, if you know any family member or, or even yourself have ever used a Ouija board, even just playing in high school or have ever gone to a palm reader just as a joke at some point, that's something very quickly to bring up to confession. Because in doing those things, it opens up your heart to a whole series of, of evils and to a whole series of, of demons. And I don't mean that you're possessed or anything like that. So please don't confuse in that in that way. But there are and maybe this is a point worth mentioning, there are three different kinds of demonic influence. You have temptation, which is the most common. You have possession, which is the most rare, but happens. And then you have one that's actually quite common that most people don't know about. It's called oppression. These are demons that capitalize on wounds or hurts of our lives or different experiences in order to oppress or keep us not free to our fullest capacity. And those kind of demons are prevalent, once again, around woundedness, but also um, around unrepented sin, and then also around anything that has to do with the occult. Those demons are very active in those areas. And this is, once again, why people have long-term experiences with, for example, depression. And I could typically draw it back to some experience or something that happened to them um, that might have dealt with the occult or might have dealt with some form of serious wound. But you're right, <clears throat> excuse me, but you're right, Brandon, it doesn't have to do with necessarily any particular event, but it could be a whole series of events. So this is all hard work. Um, I think Father Blake would admit it too. Like this is not easy stuff, probing the depths of your soul and looking for wounds either in your past or wounds that are still weighing you down now. It's really hard. I think of whenever I first started trying to get deeper into my soul and looking into this, trying just to sit down and pray through it, it's hard to do that for more than 10 or 15 minutes. You know, I'm thinking of Blaise Pascal's line that all of man's problems stem from his inability to sit by himself quiet in a room alone for an hour. Like everything is explained by that incapacity. Um, so this is gonna require some serious work. It's made easier, I think, if you can find a good spiritual director or 
even a pastoral counselor that can help guide you through some of this stuff. The workbook that we've mentioned a couple times, Heart Speaks to Heart, is useful because that'll give you something to center your your thoughts and your exploration. Um, but it's it's a it's a, it's a difficulty. It's hard to do. Um, the yeah. spiritual life is hard. So I, I hope I don't want to make a lot of our discussion here sound like nice and easy. That you just got to find this or that, and then you're you're good to go. Right. This sort of probing <laughs> is difficult. But let, let's let's move on from there, Father Blake. Maybe you only got I don't know 10, 15 minutes left, and I want to spend the rest of this on what to do next. So we've done right. the hard work of looking into our soul, identifying wounds, recognizing the lies of the enemy and the false narratives he's spinning. What do we do from there? Right. So first of all, definitely have a notebook with you whenever you're doing these sort of spiritual examinations of conscience, specifically these life reviews, and write down the wound. And then I always tell the people I'm working with, write down the wound and then draw an arrow to the lie. So we need to identify the wound and the lie. The next step is that as soon as possible, we need to go to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. A note here about the Sacrament of Reconciliation, how to properly make a good confession. As you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, many of us do not make a full confession only because we think confession is basically naming what we've done wrong. But the purpose of confession is actually twofold. Yes, most certainly to name our individual sin, but also, and more importantly, to name the thoughts, feelings, desires, and narratives which feed those sins. So for example, when I go to confession, if I confess the sin of pride or the sin of self-sufficiency, Father, forgive me for I have sinned, the sin that I'm about to confess is rooted in the fact that I do not believe the Father will take care of me. And so I believe the lie that I need to take care of myself. And because of that, I fell into the sin of pride and judgment of others. Do you see how different that is? From just going and saying, Father, forgive me for I've sinned, I committed the sin of pride, and I did that, and I told a lie two times. I did. Don't just stay at that level. I strongly encourage you to go to the next level of reconciliation, which is start naming what feeds the lie. Think of, think of those sins as being on a tree. So the sin is a fruit, but does the fruit nourish itself? Not at all. The fruit is nourished by leaves, by branches, ultimately by a trunk, which is then based in roots. We have to go back to the roots. That's what we have to confess, or else the weed will just keep growing back again and again. It's been really encouraging to me to hear people come to confession after I told them that, and they will come back and say, Father, for the first time in 25 years, I'm not confessing that sin. Because I was able to name what it was actually rooted in and where it came from. So the next step will be going to confession and confessing the wound, the lie, and then the individual particular ways that those wounds and lies have led to specific sins. Once again, if you're struggling with pornography, don't just go and confess pornography, but also in light of that, confess the reason why you're looking at that beyond just lust. There's always a deeper reason. When you go to confess, for example, judgment of others, or you go to confess anxiety and fear about the current state of the world or about what's taking place, don't just confess that. Confess the root of that, which ultimately, ultimately is a lack of trust in the Father and that he will really take care of us and that he has our best interest at heart. So those are things that we need to confess. So that's step number two. And then another thing that would be just really, really helpful is start specifically imploring the Holy Spirit for the vice that contradicts that virtue. I was in Padua, Italy, not too long ago. And there's a fantastic chapel there that is just a gem of Renaissance art. It was painted by Giotto. It's called the Chapel of Enrico Scovegni. And in this chapel, Giotto put on the panels in the pillars within the narthex these mirrored images of vices on one side and virtues on the other. So on one side you have foolishness and on the other side you have wisdom. On one side you have intemperance and on the other side you have lady temperance. And he painted them so creatively in a way to, to show how these virtues outdo these vices. So for like the fool, he's wearing all sorts of crazy clothes with like a club and sort of sucking his thumb. You know, he's sort of dumb, if you will. And on the other side you have lady wisdom. And she's sitting there and she's studying Lexio Divina. She's doing sacred scripture. Contradict the vice with the virtue. If you are specifically struggling with pride, then start employing the Holy Spirit for the gift of humility and to give you opportunities for humility. If you're struggling with lust, ask for chastity. If you're struggling with, with this sense of judgment, then ask for service and for fortitude. 
And then the other thing that I think is important, and I'm specifically now talking to my brother priest who, who are listening, and I'm so, Brandon, I know that you and I both have the same sentiment. We are so humbled and thankful by the priest and religious brothers and sisters who listen to our podcast. We've received emails from from many of you, and we're just so thankful that you're finding our podcast helpful for your for your pastoral ministry. So know how deeply I, as a brother priest, love you, and I'm just so grateful for you saying yes to the priesthood and for our religious sisters and brothers who are listening as well. Thank you for your vocations, your true gift to the church. But for our brother priest, there are specific masses in the Roman Missal for particular virtues. For example, there's a mass for chastity that we could say during ordinary time if there's not an obligatory feast or solemnity. I say it on a regular basis for the faithful. And I remember those people who have asked me to pray for that. Offering up the Holy Eucharist for the virtue of chastity is key. We don't just have to ask for masses to be said for the dead, although that's a very good responsibility. We can call our local parish and say, I would love to have this mass offered up for an increase in the virtue of chastity in the world. I would love to have this mass offered up for an increase in the virtue of patience and kindness and mercy in the world. There are masses for that that the Roman Missal provides and that often are not used. So I do ask my brother priest to please start utilizing those different masses that are in the back of the Roman Missal on a regular basis because it's also very catechetical for our faithful. So those are some of the practical ways you can move forward. Finally, I would say this. If you cannot find a priest to be, to be your spiritual director, I know that's very difficult, not because priests don't want to. We have a lot of amazing, wonderful priests, and that's the majority of priests are just incredible men, and we're so blessed with them. But it's just because we're stretched so thin, <laughs> unfortunately, and that's why we have to get more vocations, right? And so a lot of, bro- of my brothers are not able to do that, unfortunately, and provide that beautiful gift because of their other responsibilities. But having good friends who you can trust, who you can confide in, who you can share these struggles with and these wounds and these lies who can keep you accountable to them is also very important. And I know that that's a grace that we have in our own friendship, Brandon. We do. And uh, we're barely scratching the surface here on the topic of the science of the soul or spiritual woundedness, however you want to describe it. We could spend several more hours talking about it. And we have, Father Blake and I. (laughs) Um, But as we do with every episode, I'd always like to leave you guys some extra resources to go deeper if you want to spend more hours exploring this. Um, so we mentioned a couple already. One of them is the website for the John Paul II Healing Center, which is, it's correct me, Father Blake, still spearheaded by Dr. Bob Schutz, is that right? Yes, it is. Okay, so we'll include a link to that website in the show notes, but it's just JPII, JP2, JPII healingcenter.org. And then also this really good book by Father John Horn, this workbook we've mentioned a few times, Heart Speaks to Heart, A Review of Life and Healing Prayer. There's also a bunch of good prayers inside the book that will help you while you're doing this. Um, Any final recommendations or last words from you, Father Blake? I think those two resources are the best to start out with. Again, there are many other resources. I'd encourage you to look up Evagoras Ponticus, to look up Augustine's Confessions if you have not had the privilege to read those yet. And also, of course, the Rules of St. Ignatius of Loyola. These are really three powerhouses in the field of spiritual woundedness and healing. And I strongly encourage, as always, we're very supportive of tradition with the Burroughshire podcast and going back to the Catholic tradition and intellectual tradition to find resources. So those are three giants of this particular field of spiritual woundedness, which I think are very helpful. So for Evagoras Aponticus, his book is named The Praticos. You have Augustine's Confessions, and then you have Ignatius of Loyola's uh, Rules for Discernment. Well, excellent. Thanks to everybody for listening. Thanks again for all your emails, support, recommended topics, all of that. We love to hear from you guys. If you have questions about this episode, leave them in the comment box below and we'll try to respond. I know Father Blake um, has been doing a much better job than I have of getting in there, uh, but I'm sure he'd love to answer questions on this topic, which he's especially passionate about. So visit the website, burrowshirepodcast.com, click on this episode, and then you'll find resources and comment boxes below. Well, thanks for listening. We'll see you guys next time on the Burrow Shire podcast. God bless.